see so many here. Obviously ants are quite an issue and this is a little example of Argentine ants on actually an olive tree and they are little scale insects. Um, there's some little holes in those which are like there. They've been parasitised by a little wee wasp but ants get into our horticultural crops as we've heard as well as into our homes. So I'm going to flick through pretty quickly some of the things that Richard's already covered. We haven't actually discussed what we were going to say. We had sort of broad brushstroke sort of areas and there's a little bit of duplication so I'll just flick through those really quickly. Okay, one of the things that uh, I'm going to encourage you to do today and there is some um, giveaways on the table which actually talks about a checkpoint of what to do on your property is methods of assessment and talking a little bit about baits and sands and products as to how you deal with it. But one of the things that you need to know is how to actually find them and where to look. And there is a number of different ways that you can do this. So we have um, baited traps, which we can use both protein and carbohydrate baits in there. We can look at counts. Uh, where they are actually walking along a crack or a twig. You might have seen them actually walking in a trail along a curbing edge uh, and sometimes like that on a bit of downpipe uh, where it's very easy to look at the numbers that are there. So generally the more that travel over a given point per minute and the wider the band or the trail, the number of ants across going both ways, the bigger the ants nest or the trail is, the bigger your problem. And you may have one 2, 20, 30, in some cases with properties, 50 of those trails. Now the interesting thing about ants, they'll go to a food source to the back of the room, they don't take the shortest route, they take the easiest route. So to do that, they may travel sideways first and backwards, but they will use something which is, makes it really, really easy for them to actually get to that point. So therefore you need to try and follow those trails and look where they are and then follow them right through to either, and generally you'll be able to see if they're carrying a little bit of food in their mouths back to where the nest sites actually are. Okay, sometimes it's hard to do an assessment. Uh, you just know whether it's a high, low or medium um, level of, of infestation and obviously the one big area that a lot of people fail to look at, and we actually try and teach people to be a little spiritual and to look up. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It seems to have gone out of vogue a wee bit. But the, uh, these trees are, um, are obviously fantastic harbouring sites. And we've seen some trees so big and so full of ants, we've estimated the population to be up uh, in those trees. This is Argentine's ants, I'm talking to be close to a million ants when we've looked at the size of the trails going up and counted them. And that's because there's a fantastic feeding source there, usually the honeydew excreted, as Richard was saying, from one of the sucking insects, scale, mealybug, whitefly, um, aphids, they all suck sap and excrete a honeydew. So when you're looking for ants, you must look up as well as down because they will occupy trees and you'll see them trailing up there feeding. The other thing that changes with Argentine ants from one time of the year to another is their actual locations. Now I've used this as a good example. One is just a pile of timber here and the other is just a soak pit here. Now the soak pit was taking overflow from the septic tank and the stormwater and this area here was just a pile of timber. Now in the summer there was ants under every single slab there that was just full of ants. And also there were ants living and occupying that whole site in the summertime. In the winter time, not one ant. All gone. They hadn't died, they just moved. It wasn't a conducive spot to actually overwinter them. So they will do a semi-migration on your property and find a site which is suitable so that they don't get too wet, they don't like living in the moisture, they can handle it quite nicely, they can actually have a dry living zone, warm as well, so generally it'll be in a north facing area and it'll be fairly free draining, often tucked against something which will supply them some radiant heat, like a little bit of curbing or timber, something like that. It's a little interesting bit of sporum variegated one. Um, the reason being is on this property which we were called to inspect, the Argentine ants had invaded the house we looked through the base of the property, did not find one ant. 
they were using that tree from the neighbours, they skipped and they had one little twig, it was about as big as my little finger, that was touching the eave and they were crossing that and dropping into the house and raiding the pantry. And going back the same way. So if we just looked on the ground, we wouldn't have seen them. But that tree actually showed where they were actually using that as a highway. And if it's only a small weight number, they might only be like one line going up and down. So, um, but they will be there. Now, one of the giveaways people don't uh, realise, sooty mould grows on honeydew. It's not the sooty mould that's attracted to the, but it's a good giveaway. So, for example, your citrus trees, um, aquilegia, pittosporums, they all get sooty mould because they have scale insect sucking. And so it's often a giveaway. If you've got a tree that's got sooty mould, you know it's got scale, generally. Could be aphids, but generally scale. And that'll be a good point to look at to see whether you've got any Argentine ants in there. This is actually eucalyptus. Sorry, that doesn't come up all that clearly on there. But um, I've got a couple of those showing this eucalyptus tree where they're going up and down. Now, interestingly enough, those ants didn't trail anywhere. They were just going straight up that tree and going straight down into underneath the tree into the root bolus area and occupying that site. So that's why always the trees become a big part of what you're looking at in the shrubberies uh, on your property to actually look to see where they're actually trailing and hosting. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the restricted areas in winter, um, and I just want to highlight what actually happens. Now, you'll see there's quite a lot of movement from one area to another. Now, if I take this as an average 800 square metre property, that could be yours, and we look at the middle of summer, the ants will largely occupy a given, the whole of that given area, not always at once, but they will use that as their living space. So they have main trails. It's a bit like going into a city. So your first trail out of the ants' nest is usually quite big and thick, and then it breaks off and maybe into two other small little, little trails to other food sources. But in between that, you'll see individual ants running around. They're the scouts. They're out looking for other food to, to bring back to the queen, and she's the, she rules the roost. The queen basically dictates the feeding pattern and she tells the workers, which are all female by the way, what she wants because she's the one that's laying eggs and she generally will be wanting quite a high protein diet. But in the winter time things change. You can see what happens is it becomes a much more restricted area. So what you thought was a massive problem and they were invading all over generally now is occupied in a smaller space. Interesting thing, difference about Darwin's and Argentine ants that we've observed is that Darwin's will still trail in the wintertime, but you generally need a temperature which is about 15, 16 degrees for them to get out. And they will actually trail and you can spot them. But generally it's quite local to that little nest area or big nest. Darwin's, though, once they bunker down, they hardly trail at all through the winter. They will stay really local and resident within that confined nest space that they're occupying for overwinter survival. We came on board and we were looking at a toolbox approach to uh, ants as against a single product. We really believed that the level of uh, achievement we were getting with control was not as, not as good as we would, would like. And so about seven years ago we changed a number of the parameters and we looked at a number of different products. So all the products that are available come in these groups. You've got sprays, baits, fumigants, traps, powders, sand granules, and every single one of those has some virtues. And we tried literally hundreds of options. As a result of that, we came with four groups that we considered to have the best chance of getting on top of a given population and we use all four of them interestingly enough. So many of you would have used one product and not been that satisfied or had partial results. Um, so as a result of looking at all the different options we've decided that we need to actually have all of the options in our toolbox, not necessarily all at once but it needs to be able to be um, gone to as an option, as a management tool. So Bates a lot of you would have used this one, a blue liquid, a boric acid or a sodium borate exterminants in that group. There's a whole lot of different options you can buy. Um, now, baits come in gels, liquids, 
pastes, which is extinguish, and you've got granules like max force. They all have different active ingredients, and they all have either a singular um, attractant, which could be a carbohydrate base, or a mixture of both protein and carbohydrate, so that it compass, accomplishes a lot during the whole of the season, both winter and summer, if you need to. I've been into so many places where I've seen in there, usually in their porch, a little wee bowl of blue liquid with a few dead ants, dead ants around it and the owner complaining how big a problem of ants they've got. So that answers your question really, because if it worked they wouldn't have any ants left. However, you will often get a good uptake initially. You'll get some quick achievement where you'll get a drop in your population. Um, but actually the queen I've seen often when it's been there over a week, the queen's basically put an embargo on it because it's not healthy food for her and they're not feeding on it anymore. Because a lot of people, you know, say, oh, we've always used boric acid, yeah. we're going to use it it's, it's very, very cheap. That's a good thing. It's very available. That's a good thing. It's very temporary. That's not a good thing. So, you know, you, you get what you pay for generally and you will get a partial result. I'm not saying that it won't work at all, but I have never seen a complete success story with, with it as a product. So that's being pretty candid about it. Okay, bait requirements, it should be a slow kill. So in other words, when the ant is actually feeding on the bait, it should be able to take that back to the nest and feed the queen or the young and take a long time for it to actually work within the ingestion of both, of, or after they've ingested it, before they die. And there's two important reasons for that. One, it can be quite a, a time lag between actually recruiting and then going back to the nest. The second is you want to confuse the queen because she doesn't want to know where the, that food that's toxic is actually coming from. So if there's a good time delay, she's also receiving food from maybe three or four other places. She's not quite sure what's going on. It's good to confuse her. Okay, the other thing that needs to happen, oh, I'll just carry on this, it's not working too well. Palatable. Obviously, they need to enjoy the food more than what they're already feeding on. So it needs to have a really, really high degree of palatability and a long window of opportunity, not just a really narrow band of time when the year you can use it, but hopefully they will be feeding on it um, for a fair while. A little bit weather resistant if we're using it outside. Don't want it to dry out too quick or to um, be absorbed too quick and fairly consistent as an emulsion so that you can use it easily. Obviously storage life is, can be an issue for some baits, especially if they have a protein, so if we can have something that lasts a while, then that's good. Now the fact is that effect bait attraction are generally the basic ant food preference. So does it want sugar, does it want protein, or does it want fats and oils, or a combination of all of those? That's why sometimes, and we've done it with baits actually in trail, you'll put a bait down, and it's always good to test it first if you're using baits, you'll see the ants actually bypass it because it's actually not what they want at that time, and nor is the queen interested. So the food preference at that particular time you're using that bait is very, very important that you know what that is. Now, in the winter time, for example, if you're using a protein bait, almost guarantee they won't be feeding on it, because they don't need it. That's what the queen wants for laying eggs. So that's where you should be only using your carbohydrates or the likes of your boric acids, whereas in the, in the springtime as they start breeding, they'll be really hunkering for a protein-enriched bait. So the basic, ant pre or the basic food preference is very important for you to discover what that is. So when they're producing their brood, um, they tend to prefer those high-protein baits. So which bait to use? This is one called Avian. It's actually a carbohydrate base bait. And I've brought this in to highlight to you how you can bait incorrectly. Now, this is not all that good, but the nest is here. The ants are travelling here. I've put two blobs of bait, one down here and one down here as a, as a little blob. Interestingly enough, the female ant worker is absolutely wonderful. They never fight amongst each other. So once that is full of ants feeding, they will bypass it and they'll bypass and go back to their original preference of food. So the whole idea is that you need to, if you're keen on taking out the population that's coming out there, you need to put them in long, thin strands and make sure there's enough bait out so that they can all feed. 
Otherwise, we've just had a good, nice morning tea. And if I said to you, there's morning tea time, and I had two cups of tea out here and two plates of biscuits, or maybe just one biscuit on each plate, and said, you help yourselves, only two of you in the front row would actually have anything the rest of you would miss out. Now, that's no different than this situation. When you, have bait, when you are baiting, you need to make sure you put enough bait out so that there is enough food for all of the ants that are wanting to come out and feed. Otherwise, they just bask and you're only getting a small amount of active ingredient back into the nest. So we come to extinguish and bait. Many of you will have used extinguish, so I'm not going to try to go through this too much, but just to highlight a few things. One is that traditionally a lot of people have used extinguish in the middle of summer in January and February. There is a real tendency now, and, and it's based on science, that there's uh, some big advantages in using it at the early time of the year. Uh, because you haven't got your population at its height. You've actually got an overwintering population just starting to breed, and it's at its lowest point. So let's try and take it out at that lowest point. It's easy to use with a corking gun, or you can get the small container, 100 gram one, which um, is for smaller sections is, is, uh, is generally enough. Um, should be used in the evening. It does have a tendency to dry out. Uh, and break down um, and, and not be palatable if you're using it in the middle of the day. So if you can do it when the sun has dropped right down and then do it, it gives you an ho a whole night time of feeding um, for it to be used. And then um, using it in a grid pattern. Now a lot of you I have seen in the past where you've tried to shortcut and you're putting in quite a big grid. Generally what we do is a two by two metre grid or a one metre by one metre grid in really, really high infestation areas, uh, infested, infested areas. So um, that does require a bit of effort and it takes a bit of manual labour and um, a bit of bait breaking work, but worth the effort to do the whole property well. There is an alternative which is there that if you've done a really good search of your property and you know that they are only located in one area, that you've just baked that one area. That is an opportunity of doing that. There are chances are, though, if you haven't looked well enough, that you've missed a percentage of your population and you don't put enough bait out. So you need to do that carefully. So I'm not actually, the proper recommendation would be do you do, do your whole section. So your rate of use is you're using um, three kilos a hectare, which is so basically a 325 gram, which is the larger one, and the cooking gun, gun is enough to do about 1,100 square metres. So that's about an average of two size average properties. So that's, for those of you who haven't seen it, that's that green paste there. You can see it putting out there uh, with a corking gun and a tube. You just cut that off the end, put the nozzle on the end, and away you go. So quite simple. There are some limiting factors with extinguish, and it's important you understand these so you don't get disappointed or have a failure because you've used it incorrectly or don't understand its limitations. It dries out quickly. That's really important, and in the high noon, uh, within an hour I've seen it crust and the ants are no longer feeding on it. So generally if you are putting it out we would cover it with a leaf or put it, even a little bit of tubing or whatever you can do. Uh, and people would actually see the, the bait there but the ingredient is no longer active, am I right? I mean they'll still, still see something there after an hour and there's yeah, yeah, well, the fipronil, it's fipronil base. The fipronil's still there. What it is is it becomes unpalatable. When it's got a really hard, dry crust on it, um, the ants don't, it's not easy for them to take that in. Now, if they're really, really super hungry, I have seen them take it. But if they've got other food source available, I've actually seen them completely bypass it, no problem, within that crust, as soon as that crust forms. So that depends on how urgent it is for them to actually get some food. But the, yeah, the active is still there. That doesn't break down really quick. It's just the palatability. Yeah. So it needs, uh, it needs to be stored if you open it. It doesn't last too long once you've opened it up because it's got a protein base in there, so you want to put that in the fridge. Bait acceptance is really important. I covered that before. If you have a bait there, I always say to guys, make sure you put a little bit out first to see that they're actually recruiting and taking that up first. Before you go and do a whole property, just check that they are taking it because otherwise you can waste a lot of time and money. Weather, obviously don't put it out there just before it's going to absolutely pour down with rain and make sure you keep away from waterways. Generally a couple of metres is the requirement there. 
um, and it does have that high labour content where you need to put a blanket application. But despite all those other things, this bottom one is the most important and the one that actually lets you down time and time again. And the reason is this. If I have a property here that I have done 100% control on, put all my bait out and taken every single ant out, I haven't done my neighbours' properties. There's a high population of Argentine ants surrounding me, and unless you've coordinated with your neighbours to do the job at the same time, you've got an absolute smorgasbord. You have now become the land flowing of milk and honey that the neighbours' ants are looking at, and mm, I want part of that. And so, as short a time span of maybe two or three days, which I have actually seen, actually ants coming back in from the neighbours, or maybe three or four weeks, but it doesn't matter, they will get there at some point. Now you have two options, you either do it again, and then again, and then again, or you give up, or you get, or well, three options, or you get your neighbours involved in doing it at the same time. So that is probably the biggest single failing factor that I have seen with baiting that is occurring every year, time and time again, and why people really struggle. There are other things of why the bait fails, but that is probably the single greatest thing. So if you're in a neighbourhood area, you need to try and get coordinated with your other neighbours to do this baiting process. Now, the unfortunate thing about, New well it's a fortunate thing, but New Zealand's a democratic country, you can't stand there with a machine gun and say you must do this, because otherwise they might say something to you you don't like. So generally that's been the failure of this program and that's why we've introduced another alternative whereby if you do get ants coming from your neighbours onto your property, at least you've still got active there working for you and continuing to take the ants out. So we'll be covering that now. Sand carriers. We have one out the back there called Biforce Granules. There are other ones on the market as well. Basically they have active ingredient on the sand and we spread that onto soft areas where sprays are less suited. That could be your bark garden. It could be an area which is high grass, swarf area, very hard to get into, um, soft grass, where your sprays are only going to be there very temporarily because things are growing and changing. They're easy to flow. If you've got a big area, we generally use a spreader, and as an example of the little wee cheap spreaders you can buy from Bunnings there, otherwise you just use a hand shaker. They need to be easy flow, they need to be reasonably weather resistant, uh, and they need to be heavy enough to fall through the canopy, which the Biforce is. There's some examples of pack sizes. There is a very large pack on the right there, which is 15 kilos. This is a 5 kg, and this is a 500 gram. That has got a little shaker. It's all in one. This one, you get a shaker with it as is you do that one. So depending on your property size as to who you, how much you're going to need as to um, how much you want or need to spend. You're using it at a rate, as you can see at the bottom there, between 600 grams and 2.2 kilos per 100 square metres. Is it, just tell me, we, first of all, we go out to farmlands, they would have the small shape of five or three meters, and you'd buy your eggs and ants, and they would say, oh, this is pretty good, it's only $11.60. And what I must say is that then when you, only when you took it home and then read the instructions and you realised how far it went, um, and it was suitable for a granny flat or something like that. Mm. But if you actually read the distribution rates, um, you need the budget quantities, and I think um, um, tea industries have been good at making those larger quantities available, and, and I've just purchased a, a 15 kgs of quite cost granules, and it brings the price down to less than less than fifty percent if you're buying it in the smaller lots. And and that's also going to apply to the exit which key industries have now put out in the in a larger quantity. I don't know how widely available it is in other places. But um Stephen's got it available in one meters. And that again substantially reduces your price. So um, you know just I'll just want sure. to put that plug in. Yep. Think about small quantities may in the end be a lot more expensive to use. Thanks Jeff. Sprays, many, many choices. One of the issues that I come across repeatedly with people is they have used a spray and a sprayer with an insecticide that they've used for their gardens or whatever. And while you've got organophosphates, pyrethrins and synthetic pyrethroids and they all have their virtues and their benefits, 
One of the things that differentiates all of those sprays into two categories, no matter what their actual active comp um, componentry is, is they are either repellent or non-repellent. Many manufacturers don't even differentiate this. Many people who are involved with pest control have no idea about this. Many biosecurity people, having discussed this, said, I never knew that. So I'm giving you a real insight into why a product will work well for you in one situation but terribly in another. And the reason is this, is if I use a repellent and I've sprayed a big area, I will kill what I touch. So anything, nest, any trail that I've got ants actually crawling on that spot, yes, I will kill it. Because it's on the label, after all, it is an insecticide, it'll take them out. What you won't kill is everyone, every ant that's not actually present on that site. And the second thing is, when that ant is coming to your property, it will know where you've sprayed. And it will bypass that. In fact, going into your house, if you've sprayed a barrier to it, they'll even lay their own bodies down and sacrifice to crawl back over top of so that they're not in contact with that chemical that's on that ground. That's how clever they are. The other thing that happens is you might have one nest and you'll do part of it, you'll kill part of it, but you won't kill all of it. The queen actually goes into absolute frantic mode and what happens is instead of having one nest, she basically says divide and multiply because we need to survive this holocaust and what happens is suddenly you've got a whole lot of nests and you create a worse problem. And so what happens is you have a population that dips but it rises again quite quickly and you end up with a worse problem than when you started. So we're very, very fussy about this. When we're talking product, if anyone is using a product, the first thing I do is say, is it non-repellent or is it repellent? And I can tell you nine times out of ten they can't tell me the answer. And if you don't know, then you need to find out. Or pick a product that is an absolute guarantee as to whether it is a repellent or it isn't. So the whole idea of a non-repellent is that when I put the product down, whatever is crawling over top of it doesn't actually understand that it's toxic. It doesn't actually sense that it's toxic. And the good thing is, when we use something like Exodant outside or Recruit inside, we will actually deal with white-tailed spiders, cockroaches, which are increasing in Nelson area, by the way, and um, silverfish, all those crawling insects that often they, they are travelling at night and they don't know what you've put down and they will just pick that up on their feet and by preening, feeding, touching each other, which ants do, um, they're actually passing that active ingredient back either to the nest or to each other. Are, are all those products here, are they non -repellent? No, they're not. I'm just giving you examples of sprays. Basically, there's many choices, and it's confusing. And not only you guys are getting confused, because experts get confused as well, because the whole repellency, non-repellency thing isn't widely known. You won't hear it talked about. You'll talk about active ingredients, and whether it's an organic phosphate, which is a dirty word, or it's a, a, a pyrethrum, which is a good word, because that's all in vogue, and it can be registered organic, etc. But they don't talk about whether it's organic or not. Sorry, um, repellent or not. So the requirements of sprays when we're dealing with something outside, it should last a long time. It should be fairly eco-friendly. It should be medium tolerant. In other words, you're spraying on soft to hard to alkaline, to or, um, organic, to acidic, and the capable, it should be capable of actually lasting a long time on any one of those given surfaces. For example, did you know that fresh concrete has a pH of over 10? Now, if you put a chemical on top of that fresh concrete, it basically has a lifespan or half-life of about one hour. People don't know that. And that's most chemicals don't like that extreme level of alkalinity. So you've got an ant trail on that fresh concrete, you've sprayed it, and the sprays only lasted an hour. So that's why you have severe limitations at times with a product not actually lasting the distance. So the other thing it needs to have is it needs to have some physical resistance to rain and irrigation. You're watering your properties, you get a heavy rain of 50 mils of rain, you've got ultraviolet light, light coming down, hammering away at the product or hydrolysis, which is just the oxygen interaction which causes a normal breakdown of chemical. All of those things are working at degrading the chemical down so that it becomes inactive. So, that means when we actually looked at all of that, we didn't have a product available and that's why we actually made our own to stand up and meet the demands 
of all of those environmental pressures so that it at least had a chance to last for you. So when you're actually putting it out there and you're spraying all your hard zones and your property and your pathways and the edge of your homes, you know that it's going to hang in there for a few months. Now, Exodent has got three stages, and I'm just going to quickly go through that so you understand it. It has instant knockdown, so what you spray, you will kill instantly. The second is there are a number of ants that are actually not on the zone that you've sprayed. You've identified your trails and where the nests are, but there's others that are foraging and away from that, maybe tucked in the house somewhere. When they actually walk on that surface, generally they will die fairly quickly within a few hours, up to 96 hours after you've sprayed, so that by the time you get through four days of activity, you've reduced your population by about 96% within that first phase, which is quite a lot. But the next part is the important part, and it's a little bit more difficult to grasp. It's what's called the, uh, we call it the domino effect. It's the transference of the active ingredient, that's what AI stands for, that allows to be moved to nests and other, another nest by preening and feeding. So that'll go on for many weeks. So the ant walks along the surface, doesn't die straight away. It feeds and it touches other ants and passes the active ingredient along on its food, but also to the other ants. This is just a quick slide, it's a wee bit, of, wee bit of background here, looking at what happens when we have rain on top of Exodant. And we can see here there's no rain, 8 mils of rain. It's just reduced the actual level of active, but as the UV light breaks down the top surface, which is a poly, what we call a polymer layer, it actually re-exposes more active. And you can see this is really nice, so by the time this is the number of hours exposure, once we get to around about 90 hours, that would have actually taken out 100% of that population that walked over it. So even if you've had a bit of rain on it, don't, don't panic. Once the, once the sun comes out and carries on actively on top of that chemical that you've put down, it will re-expose more of it and it will become, continue to be active for you. Good question. In a wet form, we always say if you're, if you're spraying, uh, children and pets should be completely kept away for the period that it takes to dry completely. When it's in its dry form, the amount of active that you can pick up is so small, you've got to remember it takes a while for an ant, which is, in terms of comparison to us, is tiny. So the actual effects on an ant is, is a lot, but on us, it's virtually nothing. It would take, I mean, for us to be sick with this, Anyway, we would have to drink the whole lot, plus more. But in terms of a dried product with a polymer, and it fixes there, the amount of active you're picking up, even if you're walking on it on bare feet, is very, very minimal. So its, uh, it's safety level is... Those granules that you spread on the, in the garden here, yep. um, probably your children are not going there, but maybe your pets. So are they going to pick up any of that um, stuff on your paws? And yeah, the, the, well, it's, it's a dry granule, so it's not wet. Yeah. So um, the, only, the only ones that can do it would be dogs, no. Dogs have virtually no, and this is by Fenthrin Active, virtually no reaction. We do get the odd cat that, that actually can pick up a little bit. Generally, though, it's because it's wet, and even though they've tried to keep the cats off it, when it's wet, they pick it up, and of course, then they lick their paws. And that, that's when it's in its most toxic or, or dangerous form. So you have to, yes. What about chickens? Chickens, virtually nothing. The, yeah, yeah, the, the sand is too small. They actually really struggle to pick that up. But in terms of birds, uh, bifenthrin has got very low activity on birds anyway. So we've never had a, uh, an, issue, an issue where they've actually picked it up. But generally what I would say is if you've put out, the, the worst would be is if you've put soft food out onto a sand and spread area. I'm not talking dry wheat or something like that because it wouldn't pick up much sand at all. But if you're putting up, for example, potato peelings or that sort of thing, I would suggest that you should always put those in a bowl or some, something that's not on the actual sand so that it's not wet and picking that up and then they're eating that. That would be the, the area they would be picking it up. Can I, can I just go back to the issue of, of um, pets, as in cats of course? Yes. Um, so how, how sick? 
Might they count? I mean, are we talking death cats? No, there's been no, no deaths. What happens is they, um, they basically get a nervous reaction, and so you have to take it off your property and let them get through that because once they become sensitised to it, and generally, actually, it's really interesting because we'll have like 500 cats and one of them reacts, and often it's one that's in a very, very poor state health wise, and they become more susceptible than. Um, ones that are in really healthy condition. Um, but having said that, there's always a risk, so we always are really sure that, make sure it's dry. If they do have a bit of a reaction and it's just a bit of a nervous reaction that you take the cat, then in that situation they'll be removed from the property to let them recover. And, and by nervous, you mean they twitch? Yeah, they twitch. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. And generally, what we say is um, there's two rules of thumb: never spray above your waist, and always have your wind at your back. If you follow those two rules, I can spray two hectares and not have one droplet go on me. Always wear gloves. The most toxic stage is when you're pouring it in and measuring. So you should be wearing gloves, and you should wear it because that's when it's getting wet with your sprayer. Because some sprayers are a bit leaky. Uh, and I will always wear shoes and overalls anyway, so that's a, that's a really good standard thing. So that means you're covered from here and here and long sleeves. In terms of a respirator or, or whatever, you can buy the little masks if you want to do that and always wear a hat. Um, but if you're not spraying actually above your waist, the chances of getting anything, and the wind's always at your back, the chance of getting anything is virtually zero. Bees, good question. Yes, toxic to bees. So we're not spraying flowers. If you are doing your lawn, um, then we're generally not spraying the lawn anyway. That's not a great thing to do. Um, but mow the lawn first, and then put your granules down so you've cut all the flowers off, then the flowers that come through won't have any active on it. Generally, though, the sand doesn't collect in the flowers easily, uh, and it drops through that canopy. If you're spraying all your hard surfaces, there's no actual um, flowers or, or attractant there for the bees to land on, and we generally don't have too big an issue with the bees. No issue with worms. We've had no mortality with them whatsoever. Mm. Can I use the same sprayer that I use for Roundup? Um, yeah, but make sure you, don't, you do clean it out because if you do happen to be spraying around some of your trees or um, some of your, your nice gardens and you get a bit of spray onto you know, some of your craw nice creeping plants or whatever, you don't want to zap them with the Roundup residue. Um, so always triple rinse, flush. And do that. Generally, if you're doing a lot of spraying, we recommend you actually get a nice little wee sprayer which you put non-repellent spray and have it reserved just for what you're doing for your spraying, be it inside or outside with the products, so that you don't have anything there. Can you use it inside the house or skirting boards or window edges? Not accident. Accident is a good question. I'm glad you drew my attention to it. Now, accident is outside, outdoors only. It's specifically built for outdoors. It's got all those extra acts, about nine active ingredients in, active, in Exodent that gives it the resistance to all of the degradation that can occur outside. But the Recruit doesn't have all those other inbuilt properties to it, which means that, and it's an SC, which means you don't have the smell either, um, and it's capable of being used inside. Even on windows, you won't get any markings with the Exodent, uh, with the Recruit, whereas Exodent, you should not actually, you will get a bit of white marking on your window so when you're doing outside, just make sure you spray away from those. OK, moving on. So the domino effect. Let's say we go back to our 800 square metre property and we've basically killed every single ant in that property. We then have a situation where we get intrusion from outside onto our property. That is normally spells disaster where you say, well, my product's finished working. With accident, you don't have that because it's lasting a long time for you. And what happens is those ants come onto the same highways that those other ants were utilising because it's always the easiest pathway they choose. They pick up the active ingredient on their feet, go back to the nests on the outside of your property, and they're transferring that active to that nest and to the other ants as they meet them along the way because they're always touchy-feely, they, they're very gregarious. So you end up with a buffer zone outside your property where you've treated as well but not directly. So that's called the domino effect. 
and it works quite well. So what, a lot of you would have picked up some uh, material from there. We have what's called a five or six step, I've left out part of it, program. I won't go through this, we're going to run out of time, so please pick it up because you need to look where your ants are. And if you get good at it, it's not a matter of just looking, bang things around, grab a stick, I can't walk too far, um, grab a stick and beat things, make, cause a bit of vibration because they will react to that. Bang the edge of your compost bin, get them stirred up, see where they are on your property, and then we encourage people to just get a little map, you don't have to be a graphic designer, and just mark on that where the trails are and where the actual ant sites are, the nest sites. That's a good historic, put a date on it, good historic sort of record for you to know where they were and whether you're defeating the little beggars. Second thing is, make sure when you do your examination, as I said before, that you're actually looking at the trees as well as the ground because they're trailing up and down. And what we generally do with trees is we ring spray the trees about a metre up and you just spray around there so that the ants will have to cross the path that you've actually put down and they will pick that up. Now, Exodant is not phytotoxic. In other words, it won't cause any detrimental effect to your trees or your shrubs or, or any greenery. It will not have any negative effect whatsoever on that. So you've got there a list. I'm not going to go through everything, as I said, of the things you should be looking at that is on that list that you've taken there, and you make sure you have a good look. And once you've done that, you've got a good idea where you should be targeting. As a result of that, you don't necessarily have to do your whole property. It's actually doing the pathways, the highways, where they're travelling, all those locations, and you'll actually take out a very big percentage of your population. Risk assessment. Make sure when you're spraying, this is not on your sheet, that you take care. Don't have your washing hanging out, the, ch the, ch the child's bike that is just sitting there. You don't want to actively spray something that is potentially going to be used very shortly after. So what we call due diligence, make sure that those things are taken care of. The fish pond, make sure you cover that uh, or stay away from it. You don't want to get drift onto that. Um, the washing's out, make sure you're not doing just, it's really common sense, uh, but some people forget about it and you should be looking at the things that you don't want spray to be on, either cover them or remove them before you actually spray. Personal protective clothing, we covered that. Hats, overalls, gloves, footwear, eye protection, um, which would be goggles, if, especially if, you, if you're going to be spraying up higher. Um, any trees that need trimming back, that's a really important one, that if you're getting access into your house or to a shed by using a tree or grass or something, that's what we call just removing physically um, some of the problems or access routes that, they, that they're using. Now, I've been to properties where they've said we need to do an ant control program and I said, look, I'm not even going to attempt to give you advice on this until you've cleaned your section up. Ooh, that's a big call. But the reality is, is the more rubbish and the more hiding zones and harbouring areas that you've got, the harder it is for you to gain control. So all I can do is encourage you to, if you've got a section that fits that category, do some work and clean it up before you start trying to control them because it'll be a lot easier for you. Okay, spraying techniques, again that's on your list. Spraying all the highways, uh, including your wires, your post rails, pergolas, or any areas those ants are actually travelling and using as a highway. Trees, you need at least a metre band sprayed around it. Your bushes that lean on the house, they need to be cut back. Spray sleepers, and maybe about a metre up the house and a metre away from the house if you're getting house intrusion. That's really important, so they have to cross that barrier before they go in. So use your biforce granules in your gardens, but not around your vegetables. I've covered that with a few people. If you have a high level of infestation in your veggie garden, yes, you will need to actually do something there, but be very careful with a hand sprinkler and just do right around the edges, and as you remove vegetables from a square, treat that zone. It won't be translocated through the root system into your plant. It's not actually able to be systemic, but you don't want it going on the veggies which are going to be eaten. So just be very careful when you do that. So we're generally using the granules in areas that exit and um, is not going to be applied or has limited ability. So long grass, gardens, bark, dense shrub areas, that sort of thing. Okay, dust to dust. Haven't covered that at all. Many of you would have used carbaryl for wasp treatment in the past. You're not going to be able to buy that next year. It's going to be actually removed from the market. We have a very, very good alternative. In fact, 
we sell a huge volume of this called Dust to Dust. It's a permethrin product. It's very light and dusty. There's a little bottle there where you can buy it in a bigger container. It's fantastic on wasps, but it's also fantastic on ants. If you've got cracks and crevices that you can't access with the granules or the spray or areas, for example, under a very, very tight um, decking, which has got little gaps, but you can't actually physically get in there, dusting inside of that and it just covers it beautifully under the house, in the, in the um, wall cavities of your house or in the ceilings, works absolutely brilliantly. It lasts a long time and the ants don't know it's there and they'll walk over it but you get fantastic coverage. So it is a fantastic alternative um, or, or another option, as I talked about, the toolbox for those areas that you can't actually get at very easily with spray. The dust is a good opportunity there of getting in there. And the other good thing, obviously, if you're putting it into wall spacings through your hot points, you don't ever want to use liquid in that situation. So uh, just to remind you, um, so dust is a good option in that where you can actually put it through into those wall cavities and not get electrocuted. So interior, interior treatment. Some of you will have ants inside. Now they may not necessarily be at Argentine, but they could be uh, the white-footed or the house ant, black house ant. Then we can actually treat that very, very well and get good control. Now Richard alluded to it before. I tried for a whole year to take a nest inside a house by baiting of black ant, or it was actually a white-footed ant, uh, and I failed. I kept on getting some deaths, but I just did not get on top of it. And so baiting, particularly on black ants, is uh, difficult to get the sort of level of success you want and need. This interior treatment situation, which is on, your, um, on the A4 that you picked up, is really successful, and you just have to give it a bit of time. You will kill, if you've got a bad infestation, hundreds of thousands of ants, and it might take a few weeks of them to crawl over and die, um, but they will. As long as you cover the right areas and are careful with what you do, skirting boards, um, the cornices of the house, around the drop lights um, or sunk lights, um, into your window frames, sills, areas where they are likely to be actually using as highways or crossings. So ants will always need water at some point. They will always, you often see them in the bathroom or in the kitchen, that, so those areas become important for laying down some active, some active so that they'll crawl, uh, crawl across it. Now, consequently also, uh, if you're doing that and you do have cockroaches or you have uh, white-tailed spiders or whatever, really, really good chemical for that. Interestingly enough, a lot of people get someone in to do white-tailed spiders and they'll use a repellent spray. White-tailed spiders are tucked away in all the little wee recesses, very hard to reach and they realise that there's a non-repellent sitting there, uh, a repellent, sorry, it's not non-repellent, and um, they will bypass that. So when you're using a non-repellent, they'll crawl over that, and you'll just see them dead in the middle of your kitchen or somewhere. They've crawled over because they hunt at night when you're asleep. So that's a good way of controlling those as well. Okay, we're getting, getting there. Um, I know I'm very, very conscious of time, Jeff. What we use for, for sprayers, you don't have to have a sophisticated sprayer. This is just a, a standard little five litre, um, but you can buy a very cheap sprayer from Bunnings or Mitre 10 or whatever and um, do the job quite nicely. I prefer to use a flat fan as against a hollow, hollow cone because I can cover a wider area. That's just a personal preference, um, but it, it will um, perform just as well for you. So, looking hard, the total control plan. Look hard. Pick some fine weather to maximise the effectiveness of what you're doing. Inside, we're using Recruit. There is a couple of other options there as well, but we've only got that one here today. Dust to dust in the walls and ceilings and floor cavities. Um, not worry about the thermal fog thing. That would be a uh, pest controller would do that. Uh, and use the, mate, the bait to mop up if you still have some residual sitting there. Generally though, we will get a pretty good result with those first two options. So there's your dust to dust options. We've got a 100 gram and you always shake it first, get it aerated and then you can squeeze it and it just comes out as a beautiful dust. Recruit 50 mils and 5 litres of water or 50 mils per 100 square metres so it covers a pretty big area. Generally a small bottle like that, 100 mils, does most people's inside pretty successfully. So outside we're using Exodent to all the highways, including your trees, shrubs, uh, paths, fences, irrigation lines. Make sure your tank is residue free of any other chemical that particularly that would um, 
make it unsuccessful with what you're doing, so you want it to be non-repellent. Bioforce granules to be applied to your grass, bark, compost heaps, vegetative growth, etc. Uh, dust to dust in your wall cavities, under your decking, cracks and crevices, etc. And use extinguish ant bait as alternative to the above. So you've got a couple of choices. Oh, all, all the options above, uh, like exit ant and, and so there's two methodologies. You could actually combine them, but generally people haven't got that sort of money. So I'm, we're just giving you all the options really as to uh, the choice is yours as to which way. A lot of you have used um, e um, extinguish and some of you will find it being successful, some of you won't have. So you'll already have your own ideas as to whether you want to carry on doing that or not. Yes? Yeah. So if you buy in bulk, how long do the containers? Um, if as long as it's not in a really, really hot room, um, because that's what that heat is, is, is activates the decay curve. Um, so if it's generally not the fridge, but just in a, a coolish space, you'll get a couple of years out of them, no problem. As long as the, the lid's screwed down tight, and then you give it a good shake. Always shake chemical before you use it, because you want the active to be spread right through. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll get pretty good life. Dust to dust, oh goodness, probably 10 years, 15 years. Hmm. It'll last two years inside or three years inside a wall cavity, so it, it lasts a long time. Um, so risks, with no management, populations will explode to affect export lifestyles and ecosystems. We can uh, use modern techniques with ongoing cooperation from everybody by, to, to address these risks and hopefully we get a shrinking ant population and we lower the ecosystem pressure. Now one of the things I was going to say before, I have actually seen fledgling birds being taken out by Argentine ants because they do the eyes first, then they die and they just basically take the whole body apart. Not very nice. So what that, there's been no study done on the native population, native bird population actually, and we've been trying to get um, Doc involved in that. Uh, we certainly can limit our export risks and reduce property owners' concerns. And the rewards are a shrinking ant population, lowering of the ecosystem pressure, limiting risks for our exports, reducing property owners' concerns there. Um, we can contain and manage current numbers short term. Long term, we're really hoping we'll see a shrinkage in affected areas, but the reality is, is that if only 100 out of how many thousand people we turn up, well, it's probably... It's going to be about you guys doing your own property, not everybody else's. We need support from you and the neighbours to achieve this. And that's the big thing is you guys got a lot of information today. That's empowerment. And I really encourage you to talk to the people around you. Because the bigger area you can have control of, the less impact it's going to have on you as a single property. If you are there by yourself fighting the battle alone and everybody else around you is doing nothing, you're always going to have this high incursion back into your property. If you can have a big block, and there are a number of those, I've got some examples, I won't highlight those because I haven't been given permission, but where you might have a group of 10 properties, obviously the outside ones are the most disadvantaged, but the ones on the inside, they're getting a massive buffer from the ones on the outside, and they generally are only finding the odd straggler ant, and that's a great place to be, because then it's just the odd little spot, and it's very cheap, and it's very, very effective. So really encourage you to talk to those around you and see if you can get some cooperation. If you need any help, we're all here to do that for you and enter some negotiations. I had one community meeting, I don't know if anyone's here from that, um, recently in the woods, uh, and there was 15 neighbours that were there in the one site, which was great. Just one lady organised that, and I, I was there for a couple of hours on a Sunday afternoon and they're all going to be actively involved, and I th well, that's fantastic. And we know there'll be a big block there in the woods um, that they will have good control for a period of time. Will the good ants come back? Sorry? The good ants. The good ants. Yes, they do. Now, I can, I've just, I, very, very good thing to, good question. I've just been on Kawa Island this last week for three days fighting Argentine ants. Now, we've been there now for 18 months, uh, which is coming up close to 18 months, and there's areas that we've treated, and particularly some big rotten logs, um, which we have treated just with these products, exactly the same, and tapped the log, and out come the ants, and I thought, oh no, and then I suddenly realised they were black. 
I'm not sure which species they were. They were one of the native ones, and they reoccupied the space that had been we had actually taken out all the Argentine ants. And the great thing it was a good audit for us because we knew the chemical would stop working because they were in there surviving and breeding quite nicely. So yes, we get a re a reoccupation of the area that we treat. And we've seen this in a number of areas because Richard alluded to the fact that if you have a high population of ants, most of your other invertebrates get taken out apart from the ones that they want for their feeding source. Um, and we are observing those coming back in in quite big numbers.